Thanks for joining us for this message from the book of Jonah, a story about God's relentless grace. For more information, visit fairoaks.org. All right, Fair Oaks, are you ready to start a brand new book of the Bible? Yeah. yeah. Hey, if you're a guest with us and you're like, you people are really excited about the Bible. Uh, we are, and let me just tell you out of the gates why. Uh, we believe that God has put something of himself into this book. Uh, to where these are not just moral stories with a good moral lesson, um, that these words are living and active. And as we open the book God wrote, uh, God opens our hearts and our lives and starts speaking to us and changing our lives. And so we're uh, a big fan of that here. And, and the reason I point that out this morning is because today we are starting a sermon series through the book of the Bible known as Jonah. Now, if you have any background with the Bible or this story, you're probably thinking of what right now? Big fish. Or if you saw the bumper video, you're thinking of a, a, a big fish. And um, a professor of mine calls this the Veggie Tales effect, uh, where um, we have so taken the stories of the Bible and, and summarized them down to bite sized chunks for children, um, which is great for kids. Like, the gospel is simple enough a child can understand it, and yet what Jesus says is, hey, be childlike in your faith, but not in your mind. You, you eventually want to grow um, beyond that in your wisdom and knowledge of God, even as you retain this childlike belief God can do anything. And, and, but what sometimes in the Veggie Tale effect, what happens is we never grow past that childhood message. And so we come to Jonah and we go, oh, I, I, I know this one. This is the one where the big fish swallows the guy until he's ready to do what God said. And, and can I just blow your mind for a moment? I, I think this will blow your mind. This blew my mind when I realized it. The fish shows up in two verses in the entire book. Two verses in the whole book. The word great shows up like 15 times. The fish, two times. In other words, this is a story about something so much more than a giant fish swallowing a guy. Though I do think that moment in the story is a beautiful picture or a shadow of the real message of the book. And so over the next four weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking through the story as a whole. And um, if you will, here, here's, the, here's the deal I'll make with you. If you will come in here and be honest with God and open yourself up to him and say, hey, God, if you're in here, would you open up my heart and speak to me and reveal yourself to me and show me Jesus and show me life? If you would come in here like that with that posture and approach this story this way, I promise you by the end of this series, you will be swallowed up by something a lot better than a giant sea monster. You ready to dive in? All right, today we'll be doing chapter one, which begins like this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, this is a, this is a wild opening to a prophetic book. Um, Jonah is one of several prophets in the Bible, but if you're familiar with the Bible, you know these books tend to go something like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And maybe it'll tell you the word first, but here's what always comes next. And the prophet got off his butt and he went and he told the people the message. This is how it always goes for Elijah and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Malachi. And just pick your favorite prophet. This is how the rhythm goes on and on and on through the Hebrew Bible. God has a word. He tells it to the prophet so that the prophet could take his word and tell it to the people so that they can hear the word of God and find life in his name. This is the whole role of a prophet. And, and, and that's what God asks Jonah to do here. He says, go to Assyria. Uh, this was the capital city of uh, the greatest empire in the world at this time. 
Uh, Assyria, we'll see this in a few weeks, was a, an evil and wicked place. It was a terrible place to be. And what God says is, hey, evil and injustice doesn't escape my notice. I see what's going on in Assyria. Their evil has come up before me, and so I want you to go and cry out against it. Now, um, I don't know how you hear that. I have some assumptions about how maybe you hear that. Anyone hear that? And that sounds a little fire and brimstone-y. Um, well, here, here's what you have to realize. Um, what we have here in verse, I believe it is two, where God's giving the message, maybe it's verse one. Let's check. What we have in verse two is an abbreviated version of the entire message that God gave Jonah. Uh, you're going to see this all throughout the book. The, the author is really much more focused on action than dialogue. This would have made like a great Tom Cruise movie. Like, we don't have time for dialogue. Just give me the action. And so a lot of times what's going to happen is you're going to get the start of the action, and then you'll see hints later on, oh, much more was said, but this is an action-packed story. And this is one of those cases where uh, you get the beginning of the dialogue, and what the reader is depending on is you know your prophets well enough to know God has never once pronounced judgment without also offering grace. You won't find a single place in the Bible where God's like, I'm going to burn it all down. Have a great day. It's always God saying, here's the evil and here's the way out. Because this is who God is. He's a God of perfect justice and unending grace. And the second you take one of those away, that God's not a God of justice, that he's just a fairy up in the sky that doesn't really care about the evil going on in our world, you lose the God of the Bible. And the second you take away grace and say, you're going to burn, you don't have the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is more complex than that. He's full of justice and unending grace. And so when God says to Jonah, go and cry out against the city, what he's telling him is that he wants Jonah to go to the heart of evil. And he wants them to preach repentance so that the wicked sinners in Nineveh could find new life and forgiveness and healing in a way out of the dark path that they have chosen and in some cases fallen into. This is the word that God gives to Jonah to bring to Nineveh. And, and like I said, the first two verses sound exactly like you expect a prophetic book to open. You're like, yep, there's the Lord, there's Jonah. We remember him from 2 Kings chapter 14. Check it out this week. He's there. He's a prophet. He's doing pretty good in 2 Kings 14. But here in verse 3, the story takes uh, an unexpected turn um, with the word but. You never want to see the word but after God says something. So God says to Jonah, hey, Assyria is a mess. Go down there and tell them about my mercy and love. Call them to repent of their evil and find new life and grace and healing in my name. But Jonah rose, you know, like maybe this is a good thing, to flee from the presence of the Lord. So, so rather than go and take God's message of uh, redemption and forgiveness and, and grace, Jonah runs from God. Get this, you he doesn't just run from God's word. The text says he runs from God's presence because there's an intimate connection between the two. You can't say, God, I don't care what you said in your word, but I really love you. Does that work in any of your relationships to say, oh, baby, I love you so much. I just don't care a single thing about what you've said. No. So when Jonah says, God, I don't like your word, he's saying, I don't like you. He runs from the presence of the Lord. He says, I don't like that. And the question everyone asks, maybe the question you're asking is, wait, why is he running from God? And that's a question that the book will answer in chapter four. Uh, so we will get there eventually. Come back for that. How's that for a little... Uh, teaser, spoiler. Come back week four, we will get all into Jonah's motives and what was going on. But the author doesn't tell you that right away. The author leaves that open because this, I, I think this gets back to how we read the Bible. There's, there's two kinds of ways to uh, read the Bible. The first way would be a very religious way. Um, where you say there are good people and there are bad people, and I, I want to be like one of the good people. 
And so what lessons can I glean from this story to make myself a little bit more awesome so that I don't end up like the bad people? This is why when we read the Bible and we read that the people of Israel, like a day after the Red Sea is parted, go and make their golden calf, we're like morons. If only I was there, I would have been like, guys, don't you remember God parting the Red Seas for us? He loves us. If that's how you want to read the Bible, you're going to have plenty of moments in the book of Jonah to look at this guy and feel superior to him and proud of yourself and prop yourself up in your own estimation. That's one way you can read the Bible. Um, Or you can read the Bible the right way, which recognizes there are broken people and there's Jesus. Those are the two categories, not good and bad. It's broken and there is Jesus. And the only way you will ever encounter Jesus is if you can come to the scriptures with the humility to see yourself here. And so that's what I want to encourage us to do in this series, to to come to this book and let it be like a mirror that God is holding up so that we could see our own lives. To, to not be quick to Jonah, but to, to not be quick to judge Jonah, but to ask the question, how, how am I like Jonah? And, and how does God maybe want to meet me in the ways that he is meeting Jonah? That's what I want to invite you to do in this series. Like, let this book read you. Let God speak to you. Because for in as much as we live in different times and places, Jonah lived in the 8th century BC, we're in 2023, I'm doing my best to grow a prophet's beard to feel like a prophet, but I ain't no prophet. (laughs) Insofar as we're in very different times and places, I think all of us have far more in common with Jonah than we would like to think. And and, and here's, here's the good news. Some of you are like, wow, welcome to church. You're like Jonah. Some of you don't get what an insult that is yet. You'll you'll get it. Um, But here's the good news. The book doesn't end at verse 3. The book doesn't end at verse 3. So God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh. And and this is just a bone for those of you that are um, visual. Check out this map. Uh, Nineveh, Jonah is in the nation of Israel when he receives this call. And God says to go to Nineveh. Do you see what direction that is? What direction is that? East. All right? And what the text says is he goes down to the port city of Joppa. That'll become important in a moment. And then he sails west all the way to Tarshish, which was the westernmost known point in the world at this point in history. So he's not just running from God. He is literally going as far away in the other direction as he possibly could. God says go this way. Jonah is running that way. And I just wonder how many of us could resonate with, yeah, I, I've ran from God before. Like, have you ever had God say go this way? And you're like, I see what you're saying, but if you understood my circumstances, you'd be cool with me going this way. That's where Jonah is at. And yet, that is not where the story ends. Thanks be to God. There is a verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried out each to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Um, (laughs) this is going to sound weird. I love this part of the story. Some of you are like, they're losing their livelihood. Okay, let me tell you why I love this. Um, Jonah, remember, God says go this way. Jonah gets on a ship and goes that way as fast as he can. And what is God's response? He hurls a great storm at the ship. Um, That word hurls, for for the nerds, you're going to love this. That word hurls is used throughout the Bible to describe a warrior throwing a spear. So I just love this picture. It's like, God says go this way. Jonah's like, nope, I'm going to go that way. And God is like, that's cute. Whoosh. It's almost like something in the New Testament say that even the wind and the waves obey him. It's like, this is who God is. Like, the whole of creation is at his disposal. And so this time he sends the wind and the waves to go get his runaway prophet. And... um, And and the reason I love that, some of you are like, dude, but what about the sailors? Okay, here's why I love this. 
because God had other prophets he could have turned to at this point. And what we know from the rest of the Old Testament is uh, that at the very least, Amos and Hosea uh, are prophets of the Lord who are ministering in Israel at this point in history. These guys wrote books of the Bible. These guys, when the word of the Lord came to them, they got off their butt and they told people about it. These guys were faithful. They would have been great candidates for God to go, Jonah's a bum, let's go to Amos now. But he doesn't do that. Rather than turning to a more faithful prophet, instead, God runs after his runaway prophet. Because what we're starting to see is is this idea that God doesn't give up on runaways. This is a major point in Jonah, and I would really say of the whole Bible, that, that that when we run from God, his response isn't to watch from heaven and go, what a shame, I wish there was something I could do about that. Oh well, maybe the next one. That God's response when we run from him, didn't we see this in Psalm 23 a few weeks ago? That your goodness and mercy chase after me like a wild lion or like wind and sea. God sees Jonah running and he chases after him because this is who God is. If we run from him, he runs farther and faster than we can. So that by the time we get there, pa, he's there to bring us home. This is who our God is. He chases after runaways. And so rather than turning to another prophet and giving up on Jonah, he pursues him with what one commentary called, I love this, a severe mercy. And and it is severe. Um, the, The text says that this storm caused the ship to nearly tear apart. Um. I want you to notice this. When it's talking about the Mariners, it's not talking about a baseball team. Um, It's talking about professional sailors. And so these guys spent their whole life on the ocean. For them to freak out, this is a really bad storm. This is the kind of storm that has led them to take the cargo, which was their livelihood, and start tossing it over the edge. Like, what could make you just start tossing your livelihood over the edge? The only thing could be death. They're like, we're going to die. Better to live and be poor than to die and be rich. So get this stuff off. The, this storm is an incredible storm that is causing the ship to nearly break up. And so the mariners, they, they start throwing stuff overboard. They're freaking out. They start praying to their gods. They start crying out to the various lists, like, guys, let's make sure we get them all. Maybe one of them can help us. They start crying out to the gods. These guys are active. They're freaking out. And what's Jonah doing? Verse 5. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and he had laid down and was fast asleep. Um, I think every family has a kid like this, where you're like, how are you still sleeping right now? Uh, But, and by the way, if you don't know who that is in your family, chances are, it's you. Uh, But, okay, seriously, I think something more than just physical sleep has to be going on here. Because we just read, the the ship is literally starting to break apart. Professional sailors are tossing their livelihood. So this isn't like a little rock and roll. This is like the, this is like hurricane gale force winds. I don't care who you are. Like, even our daughter, Brooke, would wake up for this, all right? But, But Jonah's fast. Asleep. So the question is, like, what, what is going on here? And, and I want you to notice a word that the author keeps repeating. Verse 2. Excuse me, verse 3. Jonah went down to Joppa. Verse 5. Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship. He had laid down, and he was fast asleep. Um, It's really a beautiful word picture here. Um, What the author is saying is Jonah starts running from God, and as he's running from God, he takes this descent down, where he goes down to Joppa, down into the ship. He lays down, and there he is fast asleep.
it's a, it's a profound picture that he's painting here. That Jonah is in a deep slumber and in the most literal sense possible unaware of his life crashing down around him. I don't know if, if some of you have ever been there. But you live long enough, my guess is you'll experience something like this. Where you start to make some decisions. God says go this way, and you go this way. And you start to run from God. And you think, like, this will be a good idea, right? Like, no one runs from God out of duty. No one runs from God going, well, Satan wants me to today. I better do it. No, we run from God because we think that's no fun. This will be fun. And so you run from God, and you take the steps. And what the author of Jonah is saying is when you run from God, you do not come more alive. You grow more and more numb to the world around you. You grow more and more sleepy to where, yeah, you might physically be alive, but you do not have life in any meaningful sense. You are coasting through your life to where everybody is active and engaged and working together on the boat, and there you are down there alone and asleep. And, and I want you to notice something about this sleeper. Who suffers from Jonah's spiritual apathy? The sailors. The people around him. So Jonah's running from God, and down and down and down, he's descending into this state of stupor where he's barely awake, he's barely alive, he's kind of coasting through his life, and, and Jonah, he's not having a great time, he's just not really aware at all, but Jonah's decisions are wreaking havoc on the people around him. I mean, I don't know what that cargo was. Maybe that cargo was like the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone's like, where's the Ark at? I don't know. Maybe Jonah lost it. I don't know. There could have been something great on that ship. We'll send Indiana Jones to go find it. But no, they're losing their livelihood. They fear for their lives. And Jonah, here, here's the thing I want you to see. His decisions are wreaking havoc on the people around him. Um, Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about this book. You, you can find it on our Jonah playlist. I'm not kidding you. In the belly of a whale. It's a fish, but... It's okay, he's an artist, we'll let him go for it. And, and that, that song is on an album called The Wrecking Ball. And I, I don't know if he planned this, but I think how perfect, because Jonah has basically become a wrecking ball in the lives of the people around him. He has no idea, but there he gets on their ship, and he's just poof, crashing through their life, causing damage left and right, flipping their world upside down. These sailors had done nothing wrong but wrecking ball Jonah asleep in the ship is totally checked out and totally oblivious to the hurt and the pain he's causing to everyone around him. It's a powerful picture. Um, well worth reflecting on. Um, he's asleep to it, but the sailors aren't. And, and so verse 6, uh, the captain comes to him and he says to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Are you kidding me right now? You're sleeping? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and lo and behold, I love this, the lot fell on Jonah. Um, casting lots, this, some of you, you're like, this sounds like voodoo. Uh, casting lots was basically ancient dice rolling. And in ancient cultures, this is a way that people um, believe they would hear from the gods. Is they, they would have a side of the dice assigned to you, a side assigned to you, a side assigned to you, uh, maybe one assigned to me, and they'll say, okay, let's see whose fault it is. And they cast the die. And, and that's what goes on in this ship here. What's really interesting is the book of Proverbs actually tells us, like, yeah, humans will cast the lot in their lap, but every decision is of the Lord. And so it's kind of like what happens in this story is like in uh, The Phantom Menace where Qui-Gon Jinn wants to free Anakin Skywalker. This is for the nerds, all right? And, and, you know, Watto's like Anakin or his mom, let's roll a dice, let's let chance decide. And Qui-Gon, he's like, oh, this will be fun because I can use the force. And so the guy rolls the dice and then Qui-Gon's like, Whoosh. 
boom, Anakin Skywalker's free. That, that's what just happened here. The, the sailors roll the dice, and God's like, boom, he outs Jonah. They're like, whose fault is it? And God's like, Jonah's not going to speak up, so I will. Pa! And so these guys have some questions, as you can imagine, for Jonah. Verse 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account has this evil come upon us? Who are you, basically? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So, okay, do you see it? This is another one of those cases where more dialogue is happening than is actually recorded. At some point, he told them, God told me to go this way, and I'm going this way, and that's kind of how I got onto your boat. And like, are you crazy? What are you doing? And, and right at the center of all this, we, we get this phrase, this key phrase. Jonah says, I fear the Lord. Um, if you know your Bible, this is a common way that faith is talked about throughout the scriptures. Um, the idea is this. If, if you believe there's a God and it's not you, like if you really believe that, that you're not the center of the universe, that there is another center and it is not you, if, if you believe that, then you will have a certain awe, a certain respect, um, even a healthy fear of the one who actually does control the universe, the one who does control the wind and the waves, the one who actually made the sea and the dry land. Because, and it's not because, like, when people hear this phrase, I think you can mishear it. Um, it's not because you think God is a jerk that you fear him, and it's like, oh, God, God might send thunder and lightning, and I don't want to make him angry. Like, no, when you come up against any sufficiently great power, it always inspires a certain type of healthy fear in you. That, that's what the Bible is getting at. Anyone that's come face to face with the living God, no one walks with swagger after that. You have a certain sense of there's someone bigger than me. There's someone who does control the wind and the waves, and he can do anything he wants. And so when they ask Jonah, hey, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Who are your people? What's in your Twitter bio? His answer is, I fear the Lord, the one who made the sea and the dry land. On the one hand, that's an excellent answer. Um, and I think it's a far better answer than a lot of us would often give. Um, like, seriously, if, if someone asks you, who are you, and asks you your life story, do you lead with that? I love Jesus. Or you tell them not, I'm an engineer. I'm white, I'm black, I'm brown, I'm Asian. Like, right? Like, th isn't this how we talk in our world? Like, oh, this is who I voted for. And, like, and what the scriptures tell us is like, hey, in Christ Jesus, like male or female, it's still a thing, but it's not the primary thing anymore. Who you voted for is a thing, but it's not the primary thing. Like, what kind of race you are? It's a thing, and God wants to work through diversity, but it's not the primary thing anymore. The main thing that matters about you is that you've encountered the living God and found life in the name of Jesus. That's the main thing about you. Everything else is secondary. I'm not saying those things don't matter. I'm saying they're secondary. And oftentimes we get the order reversed. Jonah at least has the right order here. Ask him, where are you from? What do you do? And his answer is, I fear the Lord. It's a great answer on the one hand. On the other hand, though, isn't it kind of a joke? Yeah. Like, has he done anything in this story so far to give you any indication that he actually fears the Lord? Uh, let's review the facts. God says go this way, and he goes that way. Like, literally as far as he can. And I think there's meant to be irony and humor here. 
he runs from the God who, according to him, made the sea on a boat. Does that sound like he fears God and thinks God is in control and more powerful than him and smarter than him? There is a huge inconsistency between what Jonah professes to believe and how he is living his life. And I want you to notice this, just in case you can ever resonate with that. The pagan sailors around him are far more dialed into that inconsistency than he is. I got to keep moving, so I'll just leave this here for free, see what the Holy Spirit does with it. It haunts me that the pagan sailors seem more concerned about the inconsistencies in his life and the fact that he's asleep than Jonah does. But they got to keep moving. So you got this massive inconsistency. The sailors can see it. And so their response in verse 10 is, are you kidding me, guy? You're running from the God who made the sea on our boat? Are you trying to get us killed? Do you, do you hear it in there? They're like, what are you doing? And so now they're going to ask him some more questions after they express their moral outrage. Verse 11. Then they said to him, so what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? For as this was happening, the sea continued to get more tempestuous. So, so here's the idea. These sailors have more spiritual discernment than God's prophet. They're like, you have sinned. You are in the wrong. You're a nut job saying you fear the Lord and running on our boat. So what do we have to do to you to make this calm down? Because clearly you have sinned, and this whole storm makes sense to them now. They're like, if I were God, I would be offended with how you're, I would have sent this storm too. So what, tell us about your God. What can we do to appease his, in their view, very righteous anger. Here's Jonah's answer. And, and let me just say this before Jonah's answer. That right there, I believe, is one of the key questions of the entire collection of the Hebrew prophets. How is God going to deal with evil and injustice if he wants to be gracious and merciful? Do you see the tension there? It's like, how can God forgive sinners if he's too good to neglect the evil we do one another? That's a question that the prophets are actively answering. That is a question that the book of Jonah, I believe, is tailor-made to give an answer to. And it's a question that ultimately gets answered in the New Testament on the cross of Jesus Christ. But I just want you to notice, these are questions they're asking. We saw in the opening that God is merciful and gracious and wants to redeem. We see here this tension that if he's really good, he can't just overlook sin. And so what are we going to do about it? Here's Jonah's answer. Verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Um, now, there's two ways you could take that. The first way is to say maybe Jonah is having his first change of heart. Maybe Jonah is finally waking up and going, oh my gosh, I am a wrecking ball. Like, not in the pop song way. Like, I am a wrecking ball that just came to me. This is, this is terrible. And so maybe he's finally having the humility to say, hey, this is my sin. You guys shouldn't have to suffer it. Get me out of here. Let me die. My bad. It's possible. Um, or you could read this as Jonah is further hardening his heart. I mean, just think about this for a second. If you were Jonah and you were dead set on not going to Nineveh, what is the fastest way you could avoid going to Nineveh at this point? Death. Right? Can't go to Nineveh if you're dead. And so Jonah looks out at the ship. He's like, okay, God's chasing me. I could go with him or I could die. Guys, I got a great way to get me out of this. I'm so on your team now. Throw me over the edge. Um, and, and so there's really a debate amongst commentators about this. And, and what I will say is, uh, if you want to hear the answer, come back next week. We're going to see Jonah's fate next week. Um, but, but really, 
we won't see what happens to Jonah until chapter 2. The story ends by zooming in on these sailors. And so, yeah, that's an important question. What's going on with Jonah? I'll give you a hint just to hang you on until next week. I think it's somewhere in between the two theories. I think Jonah is in a process of this is life. It's not like you flip switches a lot. It's, you're on a journey. I think he's starting to wake up. But I think if he was really repentant, he would just say, God, send me to Nineveh. And now I'm giving you my whole answer. My goodness. There's two ways you could read this. We're not sure yet. We'll get an answer later. But now the camera zooms in on the sailors to see their fate. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. So either way, in our little hypothetical there, Jonah faced a certain death in the water. Regardless of his motives, that's what they all know when he says that. And so these sailors, they're pretty good people. They're like, hey, you're a jerk. You've put us in a bad way, but we don't want you to die. And so they try rowing really hard to get out of it on their own strength. They're like, Jonah, we don't want to kill you, buddy. We don't like you, but we don't want to kill you. But the storm continues on more, and it grows more and more tempestuous. So therefore, verse 14, they called out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. All right. People make a really big deal out of the fish in chapter 2. Um, and there's all this debate, like, is the fish really real? Could that happen? Could a guy survive three days in the fish? And, and we'll get into all of that next week. But there's so much debate about a fish that shows up in two verses. I would submit to you what you just read right there is a far greater miracle. These sailors, who are pagans at the outset, right? Like you saw this in verse 5 when the storm hits, they cry out to who? Their gods. Plural. Lowercase g. That means wrong team. They're calling out to demon gods. They're calling out to imaginary gods. They're calling out to anyone. But no one will answer the phone. That's who these guys were. That doesn't mean that they're bad people just because they worshipped other gods. Like, again, they look far more moral than Jonah in this story. My point is, when you read this chapter, you don't get the sense that these guys got onto the boat looking for God. They didn't show up on the boat and go, hey, you look like you might be a prophet. Could you, could you tell us about your God? They, they, have, they express no curiosity in the things of God. They seem very happy in their life that's providing them riches and cargo, and they seem very happy with their current religion until the storm hits. So I would say they're a, a lot like Bay Area people. Nice people, kind of uninterested in God. And, and even to make the story worse, the only believer they run into is Jonah. This rebellious, running hypocrite. These sailors had every reason when they heard the name Yahweh on his lips to say, oh, thanks for telling us, we'll never believe in that God. Because if you're what his people look like, we want no part of you. These sailors had every reason imaginable not to believe in God. And yet, as the storm rages on, God graciously meets them through the lot casting. When they cry out to their gods and no one answers, they finally cry out to the Lord. And unlike their false gods, he answers. They cry out to God they do what he said through his prophet. And in that moment, the storm ceases instantly. And the text says they feared the Lord. You think that was genuine in that moment? Yeah. 
isn't like Jonah paying lip service to the idea. It's like they feared the Lord exceedingly. And I love this. The author's like, just in case you missed it. And then when they got off the boat, they built an altar and they made a sacrifice to the Lord. And they made vows, which is Old Testament language for becoming a devoted follower of the Lord. Guys, here's the miracle. These people that had every reason not to believe in God and who run into a lousy, what we would call today Christian, have a revival break out on their boat. I mean, this bum prophet comes along and all of a sudden they're like, Jesus, we need you. And they cry out to him and they find a new life in his name. And they have this devoted walk with God. And this is just a shadow of what's going to come in the city of Nineveh. These guys get a brand new life. And it's all because of the storm that God sends for his rebellious prophet. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. And I think it's encouraging. And here's why. Uh, Let me suggest two takeaways from this story for our lives. Number one, what we see in this story is God loves to save. Uh, And apparently he's like really good at it, right? (laughs) That's the only way to explain what's going on with the sailors. How in the world did revival break out on that boat? Well, God loves to save. And in spite of the foolish misdeeds of his prophet, he's really, really good at it and great at working with bent instruments. God loves to save. And so I just want to ask you this morning, like, do you really believe that? Do you believe that this, like, fires God up, that, he, that he's chasing after Jonah on the one hand, and when he sees the suffering of the sailors, he's like, two for one. I'm going to grab these guys, and I'm going to get Jonah. Like, do you believe that God loves to save? Because I'll, I'll just be really honest with you. A lot of times I feel like Jonah giving lip service to that idea. Going, sure, I believe God can save. Cut me after all. Sure, I believe we could see revival in this place. He's done it before. He'll do it again. I fear the Lord. But in reality, I live with very little expectation that I'll see that happen in my day and my life in this place. And you can see it in my prayers. You can see it in my interactions with my non-Christian friends. I'm just being honest with you. Like, I I believe God can do it, but it's lip service a lot of the time, if we're just being real. If I'm letting this story read me, I'm like, God can save. Wow, what if I really believe that? And what's really exposed this in me is, is that this fall, we have this Explore God thing coming up, which... Um, If you've been gone this summer, let me catch you up. Uh, In a few weeks, we're going to be launching into the largest evangelistic movement the Bay Area has seen in 40 years. Hundreds of churches around the Bay Area are going to be partnering together around this thing called Explore God, where we look at key questions about God. We invite our friends in. We ask God to move. And, like, I got to tell you, seeing the way the Church of Jesus Christ is uniting around this, I am filled with such expectation for what God's going to do this fall. Like, what could get a Presbyterian church and a Baptist church to preach the same thing? And yet that's going to happen right here in this valley this fall. And so we've got this Explore God thing coming up. This is happening right here because Jesus is alive. He loves to save. And I got to tell you, I cannot wait to see what he does this fall. Check out our bulletin. We've got ways you can get involved. And I put a little blurb on what happened the last time this happened in Diablo Valley. It's exciting stuff. I believe we're going to see the hand of God in this valley this fall. I am so excited. And at the same time, I am nervous. I'm nervous we won't see it at Fair Oaks. And I'm nervous I won't see it in my life. I'm nervous that we'll be like Jonah, sleeping through the whole thing. Revival's bursting out on the ship deck, and we'll be below deck, asleep. Because we didn't bother to bring our non-Christian friends, and co-workers, and family members. Because there's a disconnect between our faith in what he can do, and what we really believe.
Maybe you can resonate with that. Maybe something's got you disconnected from Jesus' call. Maybe something's got you running from Jesus' call to make disciples of all nations, starting with the people that live right around you. Maybe you're like Jonah and you're running. And so one of the reasons we're doing this series leading up to explore God is because I'm just asking that the Spirit of God would open our eyes to this reality. That he loves to save, he's really good at it, and it doesn't matter how uninterested your friends or your family are in God or how imperfect your efforts might be to tell them about Jesus. I mean, gosh, could it get any worse than Jonah? But what we see in this story is God loves to save sinners. And and I think he takes a special delight in saving the people we think the most unimaginable. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. God loves to pursue runaways. Here's the amazing and the disturbing thing about Jonah's story. Jonah runs from God. And God doesn't let him go. God says, go this way. And Jonah says, I'm going to go that way. And he descends level by level into this numb, kind of sleepy, kind of zombie-like existence. But God doesn't let Jonah's rebellion have the last word. He chases after him with this storm. And we'll see it next week. He's going to call up a great sea monster from the depths to swallow him and send him to where he's supposed to be. And when he finally gets to the city of Nineveh and preaches what God said and revival breaks out, I'm sorry, these are just some spoilers for you, but in the, he's going to get angry that it worked. And when he gets angry that revival breaks out in Nineveh, that's where God himself comes and speaks to his misguided and rebellious and runaway prophet. What what you see in the story of Jonah is that God is relentless in his love for this man. That no matter how many wrong turns he takes, God's running farther and faster to bring him home. And look, if all you had was this chapter, I could see how you might say like Jonah, I don't want a God like that. I don't want there to be a God who controls the wind and the waves and can send storms into my life. I just want him to leave me alone and let me do my thing. If this was the only chapter you have, I I, I get it. But it's not the only chapter in the story. By the end of the story, Jonah's going to find out God chasing after him is his only hope. And and rather than look ahead at that story, I just want to put Jonah in the context of the larger story of the Bible. Because when you read this chapter in light of the whole biblical story, what you begin to see is the God chasing after Jonah isn't some archaic monster. He's a God of love who in the fullness of time stepped into human history to chase after us. And there's this incredible story in the Gospel of Mark that I think is tailor-made to make us think of this story in Jonah, where Jesus of Nazareth gets onto a boat and a big old storm hits. And like Jonah, Jesus sleeps through the whole thing. He's in the back of the ship taking a nap and professional sailors are freaking out. They're like, we are going to die. And just like the story in Jonah, by the end of the story, those same sailors come to a new knowledge of God and they worship and praise his name when they see he has the power to calm the wind and the waves at his very word. The stories end the same way. But there are some differences between Jesus and Jonah. Namely, Jesus is asleep, not because he's running from God's call, not because he's numb to life and descending into the depths of sleepiness, but no, Jesus is asleep in that boat because he has so accepted God's call, 
because he is so spiritually alive to the plan that he had devised with the Father and the Spirit from before all eternity to go to the cross. And so as the boat is rocking and shaking, Jesus has very different reasons for sleeping. He's sleeping because he knows, I ain't dying on this boat. I'm dying on a cross. Because the truth is, we are all like Jonah. Jesus is the only one who's not like Jonah, even though though they had very similar boat rides. He's the only one who doesn't run from God. He's the only one who doesn't become a wrecking ball in the lives of the people around him. He's the only one whose sin doesn't ruin his own life. He is the only righteous one. And at the end of his perfect life, he goes to the cross and is tossed into the stormy sea of God's just wrath against sin so that we wouldn't have to be tossed in like Jonah, so that God could be merciful to us like we will see him miraculously be to Jonah. Jesus goes to the cross and takes our sin to the grave so we wouldn't have to. This is the God who called Jonah to Nineveh. When he wakes up and speaks and says, peace be still to the storm, his disciples freak out, not just because that's powerful, but because they knew the story of Jonah and they realized the God of Jonah was there in their boat. And that's the God who is in this room by his very spirit at this very moment. The same God who is chasing after Jonah is chasing after you and me and has brought us here to hear these things this morning. And so look, I hope this series gives you faith for the Explore God series we have coming this fall. I really hope it does. But more than that, my ultimate hope for this series is that we would all come to see like Jonah, the beauty of God's relentless grace for us. That we would get swallowed up by God's goodness and mercy all the days of our life and maybe over the next four weeks in a fresh way that God's grace might get a hold of us and swallow us up to wake us up to life in a deeper way. That is my ultimate hope and prayer for this series. And so as we turn to respond to this message, let me just pray for us to that end. Jesus, you are good and your mercy never fails. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for not giving up on us, but being relentless in your pursuit of us. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. Um, I pray for my brothers and sisters and for myself, where where we are just running from you, um, where we are uh, asleep and maybe unaware of what's even going on in our soul. Would you send your Holy Spirit to wake us up? Would you chase after us this morning? And as we walk through the story of Jonah, would you bring us to a place of gospel confidence so that like Jonah, we could tell our stories with this much humility and honesty about our sin and your grace for us and the hope we have in you. So Jesus, I pray that you would do all of these things and help us to experience the same grace Jonah did and bring life to us, to through us, bring life to this valley this fall. In your beautiful name I ask.